Um, so welcome to today. And uh, this was, a, I guess, something I want, wanted to kind of talk about as uh, the markets have been acting in, I guess, the short term a bit strangely, right? We know fundamentally where we want to trade and which uh, currencies we want to kind of buy and sell. But um, but um, price action um, has been, um, you know, a bit, like I said, acting a bit, a bit strangely. Now, um, my general overview of how the market works, and this is just my from my perspective. I'm not saying this is the be all and the end all. This isn't, you know, the the, the rule, right? But this is what makes sense to me through my uh, years of trading and research and um, and uh, speaking to you know smart, way smarter people than myself. Do you know what I mean? Over the years. So, um, and, and it really kind of should give you a perspective of um, how the market works, because we all have different, there are, you know, different narratives out there as to how, you know, the market does work. And I'm not saying that, you know, none of those narratives are, are true and mine is the only one that is true. No, not at all. Everyone has their own way of trading the market, but this is just my perspective. And hopefully it gives you a bit of clarity um when uh when in trades and your expectation of the market because that's one of the things that we really have to um manage is our expectations um it's it's difficult trying to force your expectations or our expectations on a market that doesn't care about what our expectation is it's all about their expectations because the financial markets are run by the banks yeah simple and 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 that, and that's and that's it at the end of the day it's run by you know the banks the financial institutions the funds etc right we're just partaking in their uh in their market and in fact being used right we're being seduced in um into into the game yeah into their game and sometimes we make money sometimes we don't but this is my overview right so my perspective so First things first is short term price action is generally random, right? We have to accept this fact and, 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 I'll, and I'll explain why, yeah, in, in, in the following, right? So just short term price action is generally random and medium long term price action is less random or more predictable, yeah? Um, and not to necessarily just look at price solely because price is driven by uh, a few things, right? So price, I guess, is driven by, for us uh, and the banks, and the bank's main focus when thinking about, you know, where to where to put price and push price in the, in the medium to long term is driven by really three main things, right? There's risk sentiment is one of them. Of course, we know risk on and risk off, safe haven flows. But barring that, yeah, the financial institution's focus is one value. Yeah. Is something expensive? Is something cheap? Is something around fair value? Can I make money in the future? Right. If I buy now or if I sell now, if I go long now, I go short now. It's all about deriving value. Yeah. Should I even get into or even choose this currency pair or this, this asset to trade? Um, is there an opportunity here to make money, right? But it first comes with deriving value. Is something undervalued? Is something a bargain? Yeah, that's the bank's focus. Yeah, how to make money, value. Yeah, uh, and that is obviously that drives demand and supply, right? Because if if the banks and financial if financial institutions think that something is a bargain, then they're going to, you know, there's going that's going to create demand, right? And and supply and the supply equation is going to be an imbalance in in demand and supply. Yeah. The next thing, right, is liquidity and slippage. So this is the accumulation and distribution phase of, of, of the market, right? And um, how many people have not gone through the uh, stop hunt course yet? So if you haven't gone through the stop hunt course, uh, let me know. Because if you have, then I don't necessarily have to go through as much detail. But if you if you haven't gone through it, let me know. Have you gone through it? Uh, Juju, you haven't gone through it yet. Yeah, no, no problem. There's no problem if you haven't either. Uh, all right, so you'll 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 probably 
um, and and understand this. And if and, and even if you've watched it and you don't understand it, I'll I'll clarify. Right. So. The bank's focus is about liquidity and slippage. So what is what is liquidity? Liquidity is the really the ability for um, transactions to really kind of be um, uh, to, to kind of take place um, um, uh, readily. Right. So what I mean by that is what you when you have a, a liquid market, you have lots of buyers and lots of sellers. Yeah, it's just as simple as that. Lots of buyers and lots of sellers. When you have an illiquid market yeah you don't really have many buyers and sellers in that market yeah so the problem with having an illiquid market is let's say for example you want to sell um you know some some property right you want as many buyers in that market so that you have a choice and you can get rid of your your property you know um uh you know, you get lots of offers and it's easier to get rid of your, um, to, to get rid of your property, right? To sell your property to a willing buyer, right? But if you have an illiquid market, let's say you, you, you're trying, you're selling your house and you only have one buyer that comes in and that's like, well, you know what? No one else is buying property at the moment. I'm the only person on earth who's buying, you know, property at the moment. You want to sell your property for, I don't know, a million pound, right? And they're like, well, I think it's worth 500,000. That's an illiquid market, right? If you're forced to sell at a price that you don't necessarily want to sell it or you're, or you're not going to sell it at all, right? So an illiquid market and the liquid market, right? And the key for, for banks in, in the Forex world, yeah, and we're focusing on Forex, is um, buying and selling. They need liquidity, yeah? They need liquidity in order for them to buy it. Right. So if, for example, you have, yeah, let's say, for example, I have one billion. Can you guys see my uh, my um, uh, pen tool, by the way? Can you guys see that? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And again, this is in the stop hunt course, but just to go over it. Yeah. Is that let's say, for example, I have one billion pounds worth of I want to buy, you know, pound dollar, for example. Right. GU, right? And I want to buy at what's the current price? I think it's something like maybe 138, something like that. Somewhere around that price. I haven't looked at, at that chart um, today, but somewhere around maybe the 138 level, right? And I think in the future that prices should be worth 140. Let's say, for example, 142. Yeah. Because fundamentally, let's say, for example, and I'm not necessarily the greatest, but let's just say, for example, the pound are hiking rates and the dollar is cutting rates, right? That's what we're looking at. Yeah. And you think that right now, as prices are, where this is going to be an absolute bargain. Now, I have $1 billion worth of uh, uh, that I want to put into the market. Yeah. Now, first things first, if there's not, yeah, 1 billion sell orders. So remember, I want to be a buyer, right? I'm a buyer, right? So I need sales. Yeah, I need sellers. Yeah, I need sell orders to fill my buy orders. Now, if there's not in, if there's not 1 billion pounds worth, yeah, of orders, yeah, enough for me to fill my order at this area here, yeah. Remember, orders are scattered all over the place, right? There's orders all around here. Yeah. Sellers. There's lots of sell orders everywhere in the market. Yeah. It's going to be, I'm going to suffer from what's known as slippage. So if there's not enough sell orders, and let's say, for example, I can fill maybe 100 million at 138. I can fill another maybe, you know, 100 million at 138.50, yeah? Then 139, yeah? Then 140, then 141, right? By the time there's enough sell orders to fill my, you know, 1 billion order, for example, and I can, you know, I'm buying maybe 100 million here, 200 million there, 300 million there, because there's not enough liquidity for me to buy at the price I want to buy, which is this, there's not enough, there's not, you know, one billion dollars worth or one billion pounds worth of sell orders. This is what's known as slippage. Yeah. This is what's known as slippage because I don't want to buy, I, want, I don't want to buy everything and, you know, 
one billion dollars of one billion pounds worth of orders and and at, at disadvantageous prices i want to buy as cheap within this 138 range as possible yeah that's what i'm looking to do i do not want to get filled somewhere up here yeah and bearing in mind it's not just me that's seeing this information is it it's not just me yeah i'm not the only one on the planet that does you know that derives fundamental analysis right it is 138 ken okay brilliant i was i was actually spot on um it's it's lots of other traders there's traders that are bigger than me and there are traders that are smaller than me right but everyone's got an interest all the financial markets and institutions have all got an interest of filling their orders so you've got you know i might want to fill 1 billion there might be someone who wants to fill 10 billion some some people might want to only fill 1 million uh, uh, you know, pounds worth of orders because they understand the longer term forecasts of what should happen fundamentally and where value potentially is. So there needs to be enough sell orders to facilitate all of the buying that the financial institutions want to do. Yeah. Now it doesn't, now this is what, you know, accumulation the accumulation phase and distribution works in in the same way right if i want to sell if i've made money right i manage to fill all my orders at an advantageous price yeah and then i feel that this is you know this is price discovery and then i want to start to sell yeah if there's not enough people buying if there's not enough orders to fill my sell orders yeah so i want to sell there needs to be enough buyers to facilitate that yeah, then I have to scale out. So I have to scale in and breaking down my my one billion, you know, pound orders, yeah, in this area here, right? Doing a hundred million here, 50 million there, etc. And then I've got to do the same thing in and around this price. Yeah. The reason why they do that and they break down the orders, you have to break down the orders and you can't, you know, just press all right, one button to say, all right, I'm gonna buy a billion pounds right now. Because A, you don't know how much orders, or they probably do know, but, you know, um, they probably, actually, they probably do know from um, uh, understanding, uh, you know, uh, they're, 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 I guess their their indicators and, and such, how much orders are in the market. And B, by the time they, it does get filled, right, um, it tips off the market, right? They will tip off the market because if one person, if one institution is, is literally um uh, uh trying to place a massive order beyond what is the norm for example then that's going to tip off the market and you're in the world of algorithms as well right so you're in the world of um uh algorithms all competing with each other to find the best prices so there's no one institution can can just you know place an order and gobble up all the orders right it's got to be you know lots of different banks they've got lots of different technologies and also as well there's got to be enough liquidity to provide you know the um the orders right so we understand the accumulation and distribution phase and if you understand that you understand that this can also take time right so this is price and this is time yeah as a bank as a bank and as a financial as a financial institution, yes, time. I am concerned about time, but not in the way that the average retail day trader is concerned about time. Right? Markets generally are so forward thinking, yeah, and they've got so much money to basically place in 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 in, in the markets, I guess, and fill their orders. Yeah, they're thinking. And we know this for a fact, yeah, they're thinking years in advance, right? So currently, today's what, the 16th of July, 2021, yeah? They're already thinking, forward thinking about who is hiking interest rates into 2022, yeah, right? And 2023 and 2024, correct, right? Everything we're looking at is all to do in the fundamental analysis is who's hiking rates first, who's who's likely to taper and who's likely on the course to raise rates. And the earliest date we're looking at is next year, 2022. So if we're halfway through the year now, at least maybe six months to a year's time. Yeah, that's what the financial institutions are looking at. Yeah, at the earliest, who's the first, who's the second, who's the third, etc. Who's going to be the last, who's lagging behind. All right. So when it comes to time, 
the financial institutions, by the way, they've been doing this, not, not just, for example, you know, today being July the 16th, 2021. They've been looking at this from early this year. Yeah, anyone who's been with me for any amount of time, I know Ken has, I know Lawrence has, what have we been discussing, right? You can, you can vouch for this. They've been talking about interest rate hikes, tapering, everyone getting back to normal GDP, et cetera. They've been thinking about these, uh, this having this, um, uh, this, this forecast, right? For when people are going to, or, or, or I say people, but when the uh, central banks are going to hike rates and what's gonna give a currency potential value from, you know, from six months ago, from last year, in fact. So point I'm trying to make is this, is from a time perspective, yeah, from a time perspective, the banks have to, because they've A, trading in such big size, they have to, and there's lots of them trying to all do pretty much the same thing, yeah, they're all trying to buy because they see what the central banks are doing, they have to accumulate. Now that accumulation, right, that accumulation might be, for example, a 200, 300 pip range. Yeah, it might be a 400 pip range, but it's a range nonetheless. They have a range with which they need to accumulate, yeah, and seduce sellers, yeah, to take the other side of their buy trades. Yeah, now how they do this, and this is the reason why, again, short-term price action is generally a bit more random is because, and, and it has to be because the banks, yeah, and market makers, I know uh, market makers is, uh, is, is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Um, not too many and uh, not too many people online really and truly understand um, market makers. And if you do want to find out about market makers, um, I can speak to you about that afterwards and um, give you really the source from uh, my mentor, um, Mark Chapman. But um, uh, banks and market makers, right, use our lack of knowledge and discipline, right, and impatience and expectations and false expectations against us, right. So I'm going to tell you, you know, what, who the mark is, right, or who, I guess, the patsy is, yeah, the person who doesn't know what the game is all about, yeah, and it's us, it's the retail trader, the retail trader. Why is that? Okay, so banks and financial institutions are market makers. It's the, it's the, it's the job of the banks and obviously to, to, to make money as well as market makers, right? They, they have to make money as well, some way, shape or form. But it's the day-to-day, the -day, week-to-week, month-to-month job for the market makers to provide a market for the institutions. So if the financial institutions want to buy, for example, the market makers, right, are provide you know the liquidity and make the market for the financial institutions and banks yeah so the banks you know want to do a lot of buying the market maker right has to literally swallow the other side of it yeah they have to they have to take the other side it's their job to take the other side of the financial institutions right but does that mean that market makers lose money because if the banks are making money yeah, I'm not saying every day, every week, every month is not like that. But generally, if the banks make money, yeah, then hold on, the logic would would go that the market makers must lose money, right? And who wants to be in in a in a, in a in, be a market maker if you got to take the other side of the banks, right? I'm here to tell you, yeah, that market makers do not lose money, right? They don't lose money in a sense that it wouldn't be a um, uh, 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 viable for anybody to take the other side of the banks. So in fact, market makers do make money, right? They do make money. So you're thinking to yourself, well, how? How, how, how is that possible? Well, then the banks must lose. No, 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 no. The banks still win and the market makers still win. So then you're confused, right? Well, zero sum game, right? Somebody's got to lose. Who's got to lose? Who's going to be on the other side of, 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 of both sides, of both positions? <laughs> the retail trader, right? The retail trader, right? And we can get into specifics of what retail traders are and who is a retail trader, whatever, right? There's going to be losers. There has to be losers. And whatever you want to call them, generally, if you want to call them, you know, small firms, small hedge funds, whatever it is, but 
basically the big boys, the market makers and the big financial institutions are making money and everybody else, whether you want to call them retail traders, whether, whatever you want to call them, are losing money, right? And it's, it's fact, right? Market makers have a business model that makes money. I know this for a fact, yeah? Because otherwise there would be no market for the banks. Yeah, who's taking the other side, right? So everyone knows or everyone has heard that the Forex market is what? Four to five, yeah, trillion dollars, you know, transacts four to five trillion dollars per day, something like that, yeah? It's a massive market. That's what draws everybody in, yeah? Now, anyone know, well, anyone know, the, I guess, the percentage of what apparently retail traders generally make up out of that four to five trillion? About 8%, 7 8%, right, Mr. Diligent? Four to four to 10%, exactly, somewhere in that region. Definitely below 10%, yeah? The, the number, last numbers, of course, the numbers change, etc. But generally, it could grow, it could shrink. But generally, it's been around this, you know, percentage, you know, it could be nine, 10%. Right of the market, so you're thinking, well, if we only make up where is very small percentage, ninety percent is made up by financial institutions, right? So how the hell is it that you know we're we're kind of insignificant, right? So the insignificance, not really, because if you take this number here, I want to take four four trillion, and, and anyone wants to work this out right now, go on Google, Google Calculator, and and or you've got a calculator that can do uh, input, you know, four trillion, seven percent or eight percent right it's somewhere in that region of four trillion i think it's like i think it might be that like seven percent of four trillion is somewhere in the 300 so maybe 350 billion yeah 350 billion dollars right remember this is per day right so all this liquidity this amount of liquidity is up for grabs yeah from the market makers and the banks. Because these guys are making money, right? These guys have got an, an efficient business model where they both make money. And the, the retail trader generally doesn't. So where the mark, right? Where the where the target? Where the ones that are targeted? Yeah, and there's enough liquidity to go around, right? Maybe not every single day, of course, but if we understand. Yeah, that there's this much to go around generally every day. Could be a bit higher, could be a bit lower on certain days, liquidity, you know what I mean, volatility, etc. Right. Who knows? But in general, when we go back to, you know, our price chart and we have loads of banks, yeah, that want to buy at a certain price, it's easy now to understand, yeah, day to day, yeah. I want a piece of this action, yeah, every single day, yeah. And it doesn't matter because as far as time and accumulating, it takes it the time takes what it takes, right? I'm no necessarily no no rush because I'm looking a year or two ahead, yeah, when it comes to fundamental analysis. So I'm positioning myself every day, masking up my orders, not be getting caught by slippage, yeah. And in the short term, the price action can seem very random, yeah. Day to day, week to week prices might go down. They might be long fundamentally. But in this time in history, yeah, in this week or this month in history, yeah, prices could have been trending down. All they're doing is doing what? Accumulating. This is the accumulation phase, yeah? But what they need to do, yeah, what, what they do generally is they take advantage, yeah, and they use our lack of knowledge, our lack of discipline, yeah, and impatience, and our lack of expectations about really what the financial markets are really about. Remember, this is their game. They have an efficient business model. They have a partnership. This is the partnership, yeah? They're both making money. We're the mark, right? So our expectations, yeah, in the short term, so for example, we can think of loads of examples, you know, um, day traders, for example, they, they, when you're day trading, it's not, and, and, and by the way, I just want to make this clear, 100% clear. I'm not saying that you can't day trade and make money. Of course you can. Of course people do. I know people that do, right? That go down to the lower time frames and, and do it day in, day out, as far as not necessarily making money every single day. That's not 
you know, that's impossible. But I'm talking about over the medium to long term, sticking to a plan, etc., and making money, right? There's people out there that do it. Now, what, but what I am saying is that the expectation generally from retail traders is that, you know, um, especially traders that have a, have a short term uh, view is that, OK, I'm going to start to, for example, trade off of every single support and resistance level. Right. I'm going to trade off that. I'm going to trade off that. I'm going to have trade off that. I'm going to trade off there. I'm going to trade off there. And that should work, et cetera. But understanding that yes of course and you can make money right you can make money to the downside make money to the upside etc but thinking about it yeah it's very random week to week it's very very random yeah um price and it might seem like it's structured yeah as far as support and resistance because how else support and resistance has to work and technical analysis has to work to some degree otherwise nobody would trade it right we wouldn't be in the market yeah, we would not be in the market if 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 it was totally, totally random. I'm not saying that there's no patterns or anything like that. Yeah. But you have to understand that that's not where the game is. This this lower time frame, yeah, isn't where we or isn't where I like to view, right? So I'm not like I know a lot, there's a lot of new traders that are really kind of um, and it's not your fault, you know, everyone goes onto YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and this is what's sold. This is what's sold. Even the brokers are selling you, right? Because the brokers make money by the amount of trades that you take, yeah? They take the spread, yeah? So it's in their interest, yeah, for you to take as much trades as possible. Also, it's in the uh, the bank's interest, yeah, and the market maker's interest for you to be in the market and provide liquidity, yeah, so that they can accumulate, yeah, for the long term. Yeah, for the medium to long term. And this is why I say short term price action is generally, and I use the word, I'm not saying it is random. I'm saying it's generally random, generally random, right? So one week we could be up, brilliant. Hey, excellent. All of a sudden, you know, the next week, you know, prices could be trending downwards. And you're like, well, hold on. Leon said that the Bank of Canada are raising rates. So why has the Bank of Canada been, why has price for the CAD yen been uh, on a downward trend for the past two to three weeks? Do you know what I mean? It's, it, but two to three weeks, yeah, in the time frame is nothing when you're talking about um, uh, the banks accumulating. Yeah, it is, it is like that, Ken, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Ken's laughing because he, he understands this stuff. Yeah. And we do this week. Exactly. That's exactly it. You can look at it this week. Yeah. We all know fundamentally, but do retail traders have the fortitude or do they even know? Right. This is the re and this is the confusion around fundamental analysis. People think that fundamental analysis is going on to Forex factory, looking at something that says, oh, it's positive news. OK. And I'm going to press buy something that's negative news. I'm going to press sell or data. Yeah. If 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 trading, <laughs> if if trading was that simple, we could all do it. Yeah, we could all do it. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah. And again, so we get and 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 Dre says this, right? Dre says this is that it's not easy and it's not easy. They know psychologically your knowledge, yeah, of how the market works, your discipline to continue to buy, even in the face of a downward, you know, a, a downtrending market going against you, yeah? Your impatience, yeah, of thinking, oh, you know what? I, I could have made money short in this market. And you know what I mean? And looking back and thinking, all right, I'm gonna change my direction. All that and your, ex and your general expectations, they use all of that against you, right? Things, even things like, you know, I've got a daily target that I've got to make. I've got a weekly target I've got to make. I've got a monthly target I've got to make. The market doesn't care. The banks don't care about your weekly and monthly targets and your daily targets. They don't. All they care about is, is there enough liquidity? And I don't care how long, yeah, this goes on for randomly, right? As long as you provide enough liquidity for me, right? For me to make money in the, in the medium to short term, sorry, medium to long term. Yeah. And in the short term, of course, they make money. Right. But generally, yeah, that's what they're concerned with. Whereas we're concerned, we are so short sighted or we tend to be so short sighted. Yeah. And again, it's not our it's not our the general uh, retail traders um, uh, 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 fault or within their knowledge or reasoning to understand this stuff because of the amount of nonsense, I guess, that's kind of 
put out about how the market works. Yeah. And this is why I always preach quality over quantity. And I always say, like, people say to me, oh, you know, um, how much can I expect? I get messages all the time saying, how much can I expect to make every week? Uh, can I make two to three percent? It's like, what? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We have to understand what the game is from a higher level. And then we can adjust our expectations. Yeah. And I can, you know, this is this is this is provable, right? Because everybody looks back on price and says, okay, well, well, it was obvious when you when you look back of what was happening. Yeah. So so value and demand, demand and supply, yeah, right, will eventually be revealed over the medium to long term. Yeah. So we can go and look at a chart, yeah, and we can see right, where there would have been, you know, some, some crazy price action, for example, something like that, right, and whatever, right, now, looking back on the chart, it looks obvious, right, it looks really, really obvious what you should have been doing, especially when you understand the fundamentals looking back in hindsight, yeah, you, you know, you had one central bank that was hiking rates, for example, and one that was cutting rates, and it's like, when you look back and do your fundamental analysis and you say, oh yeah, that's what they were doing, right? You're, you're, we're here at the moment, yeah? When I say medium to long-term, I'm talking about the daily timeframes, for example, right? Over the three, six, nine, 12 month period, yeah? Whatever, the, whether it's daily or weekly. Yeah, but we might be here at this point in time and we're looking back and you've watched one of my videos and you've gone and you said, okay, fundamental analysis, let's see how this works. And you'd be like, oh yeah, it's true. They were doing this. The central banks were diverging or converging. And look at what happened, da, 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 right? But in this day in history, yeah, in this time in history, in this period in history, this might represent, for example, three weeks of trading, yeah? This might represent maybe, you know, one month's worth of trading, Yeah. This might represent, you know, two weeks worth of trading, et cetera, yeah? And, and, and so on and so forth. But when we're in this, when we're zoomed down into the, you know, and, and, and our perspective is so uh, focused on what's happening day to day and even week to week, yeah? We can get uh, thrown out of the trade. We can get disillusioned, right? We can get disillusioned with everything. But demand, yeah, or supply will eventually be revealed over the medium to long term. Yeah, give me a chart. Yeah, give me a chart over the last pretty much, you know, five years, I would say. And I can and I can explain. And, and as far as, you know, the moves, massive moves that went for, you know, thousands of pips, hundreds of thousands of pips, maybe 500 to 1000 pips or more. Yeah. I can explain with fundamentals either, you know, what was going on from a risk sentiment perspective, risk on, risk off, and what the fundamentals were. Apart from, and I'm going to be honest, apart from there was probably two times in history where I'm even I'm left scratching my head, but pretty much everything else can be explained. Everything else can be explained. All these major moves, if you look back on price action, I can explain it to you. Yeah, and I can prove to you what was going on with consistency. And it might sound like a bold claim, but I've traded it, right? I've traded, I was trading at the time and I can tell you what was going on, yeah? So value, yeah, demand and supply, does that mean that every single week we're going to make money? Every single month we're going to make money? No, but it will eventually reveal itself because it has to, because all of the banks, all the, all the financial institutions are all long. Yeah, the market makers don't really have a, a, a bias, right? They're just there to facilitate the 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 the, the other side of the of the uh, of the financial institutions. Yeah, they just have to they have to sit there and take the other side and make money and work out ways on how to make money as well by taking the other side, which they have a re very efficient you know model, right? Otherwise, again, like I said, they wouldn't be in business. But for, for, but from from the financial institutions' perspective, overall. Demand for that currency, yeah, or supply for that currency will reveal itself over the me over the medium to long term. In the short term, prices can be very, very, very random. Yeah, so you have to understand these things. 
Yeah. It's not about your expectations. Yeah. And what you want as far as, oh, well, this should, this should have gone up this week. This should have gone up. It should have gone up by now. Yeah. We all know, for example, real life example. Yeah. New Zealand dollar. Everybody can see the New Zealand dollar, the, the, the great news for the New Zealand dollar. Yeah. You would expect at this day in history, the New Zealand dollar should be where? Should be, you know, way higher than what it is. But if the financial institutions haven't accumulated enough New Zealand dollars, yeah, then it's not going to go higher. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they're not, they're not going to want to be left behind. If there's not enough liquidity, if there's not enough sell orders, yeah, for them to buy, yeah, then what do they have to do? If there's not enough sell orders, Above the market, then what happens? There has to be, they're going to look for what? The liquidity, the sell orders below the market at bargain prices. Hence why we trade stop hunts. Yeah, that's why we trade the stop hunts because the accumulations, and this is, by the way, this is, this is all, on a five minute chart, 10 minute chart, you know, two hour chart, an eight hour chart, daily charts and weekly charts. The question, the thing that we have to understand is that nobody knows. Nobody knows as far as the amount of accumulation that has to go on. It's impossible to know. Yeah. But what we do have is clues. But, you know, we have obviously clues from a, from a fundamental analysis perspective and risk sentiment. We know what typically happens and what has to happen. Yeah. Um, overall, if the data does support the narrative. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that every single day or every single week or even every single month, you're going to see, you know, the New Zealand dollar go higher and higher and higher. And but when, but when it does, cool, then we ride that trend. Right. But if it doesn't do it at this day in history or do it in this week in history, does that mean that, oh, fundamentals don't work? That's what the day trader would think. Do you know what I mean? That's someone who doesn't or someone who doesn't just doesn't understand all of this yeah would think and then they create narratives oh there's market exhaustion like what what is market exhaustion i've heard this term market exhaustion the market is exhausted it can't go high no it's it's just supply it's supply and demand and liquidity if there's not enough liquidity to the downside yeah or not enough liquidity to the upside then it won't go high won't go lower simple it's all about value liquidity and slippage yeah. So when you're trading now, and I'm just going to wrap this up. So when you're looking to trade and let's say, for example, you know, week to week, yeah, you've lost a trade or two. All right, fine. Cool. Do you know what I mean? Does that mean that the strategy doesn't work? Of course not. Because short term wise, price action is generally random. You have to know this. I don't care what anybody says. Right. In that fact, if anyone can tell me, yeah, that they know what's going to happen in the market. Right. You know what I'm going to ask them? I'm going to say, all right, you know what's going to happen in the market. Bet your house on it. Bet everything you have on that one trade. And you'll see how quickly they go. Ah, well, well you don't know, do you? Because if you know a certainty, right, I will bet everything I have that the sun's going to come up in the morning. And even then, that might not be a bet you want to take, as sure as it might be. Yeah, as night may follow day and day may follow night, it might not happen, right? The world could end, comet, whatever it is. But that's a bet I'm willing to take. But the point is, there are no certainties. So anyone who tries to fool you into thinking, oh, yeah, I, could, I predicted this, all it is, short-term price action is random. Yeah? And it's 50-50. They just so happen to get it right in this day and time. Do you know what I mean? And consistently, there are, there are people that do it. And again, I'm not shading anybody. I'm not slighting anybody. There are people that have systems. Of course there are, right? There has to be. But generally, if you this is this is my view of how the Forex market works and my approach and my top-down approach. So whenever I go through, for example, a drawdown, yeah, I don't get um, uh, disappointed. I don't get, um, you know, frustrated or anything like that. I'm just like, okay, just keep taking the trades. Just keep taking the trades because at some point you're going to be right and the market's going to agree with you. You're going to time it correctly. And when you do, that's going to be your 20, 30, 40 to one type trades. Yeah. So that's pretty much what I was really wanted to talk about on Wednesday, but I didn't think I could give it the, uh, the time.
but um but yes seems like there are lots of people sorry calmerg i know calmerg have just come in i know a few other people have come in as well fredx you probably you've missed pretty much the majority of it um uh this is being recorded so uh so you can you can watch it back um we'll look into some charts as well i've got a bit of time a little bit of time so we'll look into some live charts as well anyways um so that wraps up the presentation i'll just get into some of the questions <clears throat> 